morning, everyone, and welcome to New Spring Church. We're so glad that you're here today. Right now, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to enter into a time of worship together, but i got to tell you guys something. Um, God knew what was going to happen on April 29th, and uh, he put these songs that we're about to sing together months ago. We didn't change the set list for this weekend just because of what's happened in our community. And God also gave us a verse to come in with today. And it's this, it's Psalm 100 verse four. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. We have had, we have had people in every single service this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, sitting on the first two rows that lost everything but their lives and their families' lives. That, that's no different for this service. And we know that there's a great sense of sorrow that comes with any loss. But I think for a lot of people, myself included in my family, one of the things that we felt deeply as the tornado was passing through our community was this sense of fear, but a loss of peace in that moment. As the chaos was happening, and I remember just thinking to myself, I have somewhere that I can go. And I'm not talking about my basement, y'all. <laughs> I'm saying that I found myself in desperate need of the God of the universe. And when I looked out my back window and I saw that debris field and my home was spared, but I knew that it was impacting people that I loved and my friends and my family. I found myself going before the Lord and when everything subsided, I felt a sense of sadness only to be woken up the next morning with the news that not one person was killed. Are you kidding me? And I know there are so many prayer warriors in this room that as it passed your home, you were praying for your friends and your family. And as it was passing over your homes, as you were hunkered down in your basements, coming out to nothing, you were singing the praises of God because he spared our lives. And this morning, for those of us who lost something in the storm, we can still sing the song of praise to our great God because we have a peace in this life that passes any sense of understanding. And it flows from him. So would you sing that when peace like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll what King of Kings and Lord of Lords and fight the fight that we need to by lifting up a prayer. So would you sing this out with us? When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is 
We say thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Hey. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on and lift it up, church. Oh, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Baptism is a way Christ followers go public with their faith. By being lowered completely under the water and raised back up to their feet, they're identifying with Jesus, sharing that because of his sacrifice, the old person is dead and buried, and now they're a new person alive in Christ. Baptism is a visible symbol of an invisible commitment. It doesn't create a new relationship, but announces one that's already there. It's a visible symbol of a Christ follower's commitment to Jesus. Celebrate with us as we watch this expression of faith. 
My name is Chandler Hinkleman, and I am 21 years old. I am from Valley Center, Kansas. Growing up, my family did not go to church. As a kid, I was curious about who God was and often asked my mom who God was. She told me the idea of God and that we should always follow Him and believe in Him. Still, I was not too sure how to do that. When I was in high school, we found New Spring, and I enjoyed learning about God and what it means to be a Christian. My senior year of high school, my grandpa passed away from a stroke. He would always tell me that he would save a spot for me in heaven next to him. When he passed away, I started to grow more and more in my faith. I now attend Tabor College and I'm a senior. Tabor has offered me a lot of opportunities to grow in my faith. At Tabor, we have chapel and I will never forget the feeling during Jesse Allen's speech. At the end of his speech, he asked everyone to stand up if you wanted to accept Christ in your life. In this moment, I knew that it was not my own strength that made me stand up, but that God was in the room. That's when I fully surrendered my life to Christ. Since that moment, I have been more thankful for my life and what I have. I have started to enjoy reading scripture and pray more than before. Some people I wanna thank would be Kylie Christ, who is my girlfriend. She pushes me every day in my faith and makes me a better person. Also, Cameron Landon, who is one of my best friends I met through Tabor. Cam has done nothing but encourage my growth in faith by starting Bible studies and just talking with me. I want to be baptized to show the world that I have committed my life to God. I want to show people that God loves everyone and that he has changed my life and can change theirs as well. Well, that's awesome, Chandler, and, and so proud of you that you're standing for Jesus Christ and that you want to tell the world that you are a Christian. You're not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And based on that, it gives me great joy to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Thank you. Julie Austin, the band, all of you guys, what a blessing you've been. It's been to worship with you. Starting last night, earlier today, and just throughout the weekend, it's been great to worship. Normally, this is the time when we receive the offering, and I kind of share with you some things that are coming up, but I, I really think before we do anything else, we need to stop and give God gratitude for how he took care of so many of us on Friday night. <laughs> You know, I know many of us live in, of course we come from all over. Some of you drive as far as four hours one way to be at New Spring, but uh, there are a number of us who do live in Andover, I do, and then also Eastern Wichita. And uh, actually, Mary Alice and I were out driving on the road. We didn't realize, Mary Alice told me this morning, she said I was just doing the numbers. We'd look behind our shoulder, we'd have seen the tornado. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I gotta be honest with you. Um, as a longtime resident of Andover, when I left for the afternoon, first afternoon service yesterday, I, it was my first time to get out and drive around. And, and just right around the corner from me, there are new Springers that lost their home. They, by the way, they were in our service last hour. I should say something quickly. They lost their house, not their home. But when I looked at the houses, that in many cases. I was worshiping with this guy. Matt Plank is here. Oh, Matt is here? Okay, Matt. Matt lives right around the corner from me, he and Holly. And, and um, Matt was telling me yesterday on the phone, Noah's, Noah's window, the chapter was Psalm 91. And you were downstairs reading that when the siren went off and the tornado came and took their house away. and. And God kept him and Holly and their kids safe. Amen. We're just so thankful for that. For a while, as I drove and I just saw the wreckage, and in fact, I just walked past your house that morning, Matt. I, you, I, I haven't told you this yet. I was listening to one of my old sermons, and just as I walked past your house, the sermon I was listening to was God is faithful. And I just, on the way to church, I just started sobbing because I, I saw houses that I've driven past for 35 years. And, and, uh, and all of a sudden though, it's like the Holy Spirit just turned me around and said, wait a minute, nobody died. Yeah. The end over why I spent, I've spent countless hours in, had people working out, they were all able to get into the locker room and nobody died and nobody was very seriously injured. And I don't know the ways of God, they're past finding out, I just know this. I know that what Satan meant to do, to, meant to harm, God in his mercy and his grace put his angels around us. And for that, we need to give him glory and praise today. But on a practical note, we also want to be boots on the ground. And I, I know our New Spring small groups just immediately sprang into action. And there's just so many great stories that came from that. But my, my executive pastor, Billy Poor, had a conversation with Paul Dome and his helping hands. And it is an organization that you know about every Christmas. You know, they, they are they're there to provide basic needs, furniture, clothes, food items especially during disaster relief. And, and when we called yesterday, we found out because of the Andover tornado uh, that they were getting a little light in that. So we started a fund at the service last night. And when you, if you give electronically at New Spring like Mary Alice and I do, you'll notice that on that list of options that you have to give, there is a, an option that said, His Helping Hands Andover Tornado. And by the way, you guys, just in a few hours, you guys have already raised over $34,000. <laughs> And, and we're going to get that to them ASAP so they'll have that. But uh, here's what I want to let you know. If, you, if, if God leads you to add something to your gift, and uh, just, it, you know, again, you'll find it. His Helping Hands, New Spring Tornado. By the way, all loose change, all loose currency that comes in today goes to that fund. So I just want to let you know about that. But before we go any further, um, let's just take a moment to pray. We want to pray for those uh, who, are, who have lost material possessions and lost houses and that can be so disconcerting we want to pray for them and then we also want to give god gratitude and thanks for his mercy 
Let's just pray. Father, thank you, God, for your kindness to our city and the way you uh, kept anyone from being killed or very seriously harmed. But we do pray for those, Lord, who have lost their houses and just going through the turmoil. And I pray, God, that your grace might be upon them and their families. And may we get to know you closer through this whole process because what's most important is that we know you and that we touch you and that we have a sense of your presence in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. You may be seated. And I'm now going to ask the guest services to come forward to receive the offering. By the way, I'm not preaching, so that's when I get really dangerous because I talk too much. But I will be preaching next week because next week is Mother's Day and I have a tremendous message that God has given to me. It's called A Whole New Way of Living. Mothers, we're going to celebrate you next week. We have a little gift for you. And then on top of that, there are going to be places where you can have your photo made, kind of photo booths where you can have your photo made with your families. So that's all coming up next week. And now I have a huge announcement to make. All of you who are Southern Kansas natives, you know that we do something here in Wichita. Uh, in June called Wichita River Festival. And I don't know if you've like looked at what's on the schedule yet. I know I saw Willie Nelson's going to be in town. I'm just glad Willie's still alive after all these years. <laughs> but what you might not know, on June 7th, Tuesday night, the whole evening belongs to New Spring Worship. And so... <laughs> We're going to be bringing Jesus to Wichita, Kansas. It's going to be a great night. Uh, Austin was in my office along with several of the other worship team, and we were just going through the, I've seen the song layout. It's going to be huge. One more time, that's June 7th, Tuesday night. And by the way, I've been, I think Pastor Dan Kubish told me that if you buy your River Fest button, which is your admission, if you get it before Thursday night at midnight, it's $10. After that, it's $15. So just a word to the wise. I think you can even get these online. So it's a great time. We're looking forward to a wonderful service. In just a moment, Stephen will be back to preach week two of the Speak Out series. I've heard the message. It's a great blessing. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you very soon. We're so glad you've joined us this weekend. Here's a look at some things coming up. First Wednesday, our monthly midweek service is happening this Wednesday, May 4th at 6.30 p.m. Join us as we take communion together, worship, and hear an encouraging message. Child care is available for children up through first grade. If you have questions about New Spring and the opportunities we offer, or you're ready to become a member, sign up for one of our next Life at New Spring sessions happening May 14th and 15th. These are casual get-togethers over a free dinner or brunch provided by Newspring. Sign up at newspring.org slash life at Newspring. You can be a part of something big when you give to Newspring, and there are so many ways to give. You can give when the offering buckets are passed during service at any of our kiosks around campus, online at newspring.org slash give, or on our app. Just search Newspring Kansas in your app store. You can choose a one-time or recurring gift. Again, we're so glad you've joined us for the second weekend of our series, Speak Out. Thanks for being here. Maybe it's time for you to speak out. Good morning, New Spring. It's good to see you today. Uh, we're in the middle of a series that I've been really excited about for a long time. It's called Speak Out. And last week, we talked about how uh, nothing should stop us from being a witness for Jesus Christ. And we talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit can give you the strength to speak out on behalf of God to the world. And uh, I was really, uh, I, I've been really excited about this week, though, because this week, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. And um, I, I want to give a message about leadership. Because this topic, Speak Out, and the topic of leadership are so intertwined. I just want to talk about uh, what does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to be a leader? And I don't know if you've noticed this today, but we need more leaders. We need more leaders today. And I'm not talking about influencers, okay? We, we've got plenty of influencers. No, no offense to the influencers. You guys are great. But, uh, you know, in, in our culture, we got influencers, and they, 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 you know, they, they want to sell us sneakers and jewelry and all that stuff, and that's great. But I'm talking about leaders, leaders. We need leaders today. We're running a little bit low on leadership, but we need that. And, um, you know, 
I, and I, I understand, I understand why leadership is a little bit rare today because let's face it, being a leader is not easy. It's not a cakewalk when people look to you to make decisions. Uh, let, let's take fatherhood, for example. I think fatherhood is a great example of leadership. Um, when, when Elle and I were having our first, when we were having Sophie, um, I was absolutely in over my head, 100%. And when Elle's family found out that we were having uh, Sophie, I got all this advice about being a leader in the delivery room. You know, the family was like, all right, Stephen, you got to be a leader in there. You got to be a leader. You got to speak words of comfort, motivation, and encouragement. And I'm like, all right, yeah, awesome. Advice taken and everything. And I was getting pumped up and I was doing a little bit of reading, you know, about being in there, kind of trying to be motivational and helpful. But then, guys, you know what it's like. You actually get to the delivery room. And ladies, I promise, we try to be helpful, really. But we can be just a little bit useless in the living room sometimes. And I mean, because I, I, I realized when, when we actually got in there and Elle started having contractions and everything was moving so fast, I realized I don't know anything about childbirth. Absolutely nothing. Like, I know so little about childbirth. I, I thought Lamaze is a place where you grab donuts and coffee, all right? <laughs> I just... I just didn't know anything, you know, and again, this is our first and, uh, and I just, you know, we get into the delivery room and everything's happening so fast. The nurses are trying to communicate with me and I'm just like, uh-huh, 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 you know, I'm like terrified. And then it comes time for the epidural and the nurse, of course, before she starts, shows me the needle. And I see this long, you know, women are so much tougher than men. I'm sorry, but they show me this long, long needle and they're like, all right, so we're going to put the needle in. And I'm like, Okay. And then she says, we're going to give you a job. Now that's a problem. Okay. We're going to give you a job. That's dangerous when in the delivery room, the nurse says, we're going to give the man a job. But so she says, your job is you're going to hold Elle's shoulders while we start the epidural. And I'm like, okay, all right, all right, all right. You know, just terrified. And, um, as they begin the epidural, I remembered that advice I got from her family about being, you know, words of comfort, motivation, and encouragement. And uh, I opened my mouth, and that was where I went wrong. Because, uh, you know, I'm holding Elle's shoulders because that's my job. And then I remember, speak words of comfort. And so I open my mouth, and I say, and I apologize for this already. I say, I say, Elle, they just started the epidural. Do you feel good? <laughs> the dumbest thing I have ever said in my entire life. The dumbest thing, the nurse looked at me and I could read her face. She was like, she was trying to communicate to me, many men have said dumb things in this delivery room. You have now won the award. <laughs> you have now won the award for dumbest thing. And Elle's response was exactly what you would expect it to be. She said, do I feel good? Do I feel good? Do I feel good? Guys, when your wife says the same sentence three times in a row, you better pray you live to see the sunrise, guys. You better pray you live to see the sunrise. Thankfully, I did live. She didn't kill me. Uh, and we had a beautiful baby girl. She's five now. Uh, I can't believe that Sophie's five years old. And then a year and a half later, it was kind of like Irish twins. A year and a half later, we had our son, Zeke, who's about to turn four in just a couple weeks. And being a dad has taught me so much about leadership because, you know, by the way, we need dads today. We need fathers today. It's an important leadership role that we need more of. And so dads, you guys are awesome. That's, a, that's an example of leadership. Being a dad has taught me about leadership. I'm not perfect at it. I've learned a lot of things over the years. I'm continuing to learn. Uh, but dads are important. That's, a, that's an example of leadership. I think about many other examples of leaders here in the room. I think about moms. Oh my goodness, moms. You guys are the glue that keeps society together. Thank you, thank you, thank you, 100%. Moms, you're amazing. I think about teachers. Teachers never get enough credit and they don't get paid enough. Teachers, you are amazing. Teachers, you're amazing. I think about managers. I think about small group leaders here at New Spring. I think about elected officials, uh, business owners. I think about law enforcement. I think about our brave men and women who were protecting us on Friday night, the, our, our first responders. They know a thing or two about leadership, I would say. They know a thing or two about leadership. I think about our men and women who serve in the military, and we thank you for your service. We thank you for what you do for our country. You guys are amazing. There's so many examples of people in this room who are leaders in one form or another. Maybe you say, Stephen, sometimes I don't feel like a leader. Well, you are. You are. 
We have so many examples of leaders in this room, and that's why I wanna talk about leadership because in our culture today, true leadership is under assault. We, so many times today, we see anti-leadership, but I wanna talk about what leadership means. And today, I wanna talk about an incredible woman in the Bible who understood what leadership was. I wanna talk about a lady named Queen Esther, and I wanna tell you her story because in this series, Speak Out, The idea of speaking out and the idea of leading are tied together because you can't have one without the other. And Esther was someone who understood what it meant to speak out and she understood what it meant to be a leader. And I wanna tell you her story because it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible and I know you guys love it too. So this is, this is, let me give you some background for the story of Esther. It all started in about 480 BC, which also happens to be about the same year that Betty White was born in 480 BC. (laughs) It was a terrible joke. Um, So in 480 BC, Persia ruled the world. And uh, it was an extremely large empire. It stretched all the way from modern day Libya in the west to modern day Pakistan in the east. It stretched all the way from modern day Russia in the north to modern day Saudi Arabia in the south. It was 2.9 million square miles in size. It had over 50 million people in it. It was the largest empire that the world had ever seen. And at the top of this empire, ruling the whole thing, was a guy named Xerxes. Xerxes was the king of Persia. He was the head honcho. Xerxes was in charge. Xerxes was the, I almost called him Xanax. Xerxes, (laughs) Xerxes. He was in charge of the whole empire. And the reason why I bring him up is that Xerxes is a major character in the book of Esther. If you read the book of Esther, he's all over the place. So that's who he is. And... um, and, this, and, and this, is, this is what happens. The book of Esther begins like you would expect any good, wholesome Bible story to begin. It begins with a whole bunch of guys getting hammered for 180 days straight. That's how the book begins. Uh, I think I better explain. Uh, so for 180 days, Xerxes throws a party. And this is an out of control, wild, crazy party where bad stuff is happening, okay? It's the kind of party where everyone's saying, watch this, and something bad happens. It's that kind of party. <laughs> And 100, I mean, can you imagine 180 days of partying? 180 days, even Charlie Sheen is like, guys, <laughs> come on here. Um, <laughs> and, and that's what's going on. And the reason why we know it was a wild party is it says this in the, in the book of Esther chapter one, by edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. That is a mistake, okay? Terrible mistake. And what happened was the king had too much to drink. He got very intoxicated. And historians tell us that Xerxes was a very impulsive guy. He made decisions without thinking. He made decisions without thinking them through, which that's a problem. You mix that with alcohol, bad things are gonna happen. And sure enough, that's what happened because he's in the middle of this party and he calls for Queen Vashti, who was his queen at the time. He calls for her to show up and to show her beauty to him and his drinking buddies, which that already sounds creepy, but it's worse than that because Bible Bible scholars tell us he was basically asking Vashti to show up with her crown and nothing else, which is messed up. And Queen Vashti, to her credit, says no, and good for her. She said no, and she didn't show up. Well, the king is drunk. He doesn't know what he's doing. And so he fires her. He fires Queen Vashti and says, be gone with you. And she is no longer queen. He has no idea what he's doing. But then, like after so many parties, after that, he woke up the next morning like, what did I do? Like he's asking everybody what he did because he doesn't even remember the night before. And when he finds out what he did, his servants realize they got to do damage control because now the king has no queen Uh, He embarrassed himself, and the empire is in jeopardy when you have a king and no queen. So this is what his servants come up with. This is their idea. So his personal attendants suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. After that, the young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king. So he put the plan into effect. What you are looking at is the, is the Miss Persia competition. It was the first nationwide beauty pageant. Over 25, there's over 25 million women in this empire and everybody's got a shot to become the next queen of Persia. And that is where we, this is when we meet the characters, the main characters in our story. Because in, in Esther, we learn this about the main characters. Check this out. At that time, 
There was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. Now this is a, let me, let me tell you what's going on. Esther and Mordecai are Jews who are living in a foreign land. They're immigrants because many years before their ancestors had been captured by the Babylonians and then the Persian empire swallowed the Babylonian empire. So basically they're hundreds of miles from home, but these are two exceptionally unique people. Esther, we learned she's very beautiful. She's very intelligent. She's, she's beautiful on the inside and the outside. She's a very beautiful woman. And Mordecai, this is what I love about Mordecai. Mordecai, is, he's a security guy. He's a tough guy. He's a big guy. He's a burly guy, but he's a big guy with a, with a teddy bear heart. You ever meet a big guy with a teddy bear heart? That's Mordecai. Like he's the kind of guy where when people see him coming, they're worried he's gonna beat them up and then he gives them a hug. Like he's that kind of guy. If you've ever met someone like that. And because he has a big heart, when he found out that his young cousin lost her parents, and we don't know how her parents died, it doesn't say, but when he found out that his young cousin lost her parents, he takes her in and he becomes dad. I mean, he went from being her cousin to becoming the father figure. And as you can imagine, being the security guy who took in his young cousin, he's very protective, you know? I can just kind of, you know, I don't know if it went down exactly like this, but I can kind of picture him on the front porch when all these guys try to come knocking on her door, you know, because she's very beautiful and all these guys are after her. And, you know, he's out there with a shotgun, kind of keeping watch. Some guy walks up, he's like, hey, I got my eyes on you. I got my eyes on you. Hey, 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 I don't care if you found her on Persian Mingle. I don't care, okay? <laughs> You know, go, go somewhere else. I mean, he's protective. He's Mordecai, big security guy taking care of his young cousin when she's a teenager. But one day, one day, there's a, there's a guy that comes knocking on the door and it's not some guy trying to ask her on a date. It's a messenger from the king because she has been recruited to be a part of the Miss Persia competition because word has gotten out about her beauty and Mordecai, there's nothing he can do. And this is what happens. This is what happens. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa. She's been recruited to the Miss Persia competition. And I'm sure Mordecai was a little bit overwhelmed. And I can tell he was protective because later on in the book, he continually sends messengers to her to try to figure out how she's doing and if she's okay, because he's just that kind of guy. He's an awesome guy. But then all of a sudden, Mordecai gets another knock on the door and it's a messenger for him. Now, thankfully, it wasn't to recruit him to the beauty competition, all right? That's not what happened. Uh, he was being recruited by the king for a different reason because the king found out that Mordecai is good at security. So the king sends Mordecai a request saying, hey, how would you like to be in charge of the secret service down at the palace? And Mordecai was like, I'll think about this for a second. Yes. And so Mordecai actually becomes the bodyguard for the king. And so, I mean, these, these two people, like the world has opened up to them. Esther is in, is in the Miss Persia competition, which by the way, she's gonna smoke the competition. And Mordecai is the bodyguard for King Xerxes. I mean, they're living large. I mean, how could this possibly go wrong? How could it possibly go wrong? But of course, every good story has a villain. And in this story, you know, there's a lot of villains in the Bible. Many villains, many, many villains. But out of all the villains, I would say next to the devil himself, this villain is the most dark, scary, messed up, terrifying villain in the Bible, and his name is Haman. Haman is second in command to the king. He's the most powerful person in the Persian empire next to King Xerxes. And what you need to know about Haman is Haman loves him some Haman. All right, Haman is all about Haman. If you look up the word narcissist in the dictionary, you're gonna find Haman's picture right there. It's gonna be a really old picture. Uh, it's more like a painting probably. Uh, but he's a narcissist. And like any narcissist, he wants to go after anyone who gets in his way because he wants everyone to worship him and to worship what he believes. And so he has this rule that when he walks down the street, everybody's gotta bow to him. Everybody has to bow. Uh, I mean, that, that's a toxic way of living when everybody has to bow to you because that's just ridiculous. So he walks down the street, but there's one person who never bows to him, and that's Mordecai. Because Mordecai works at the palace. He's in charge of the secret service, and every day Haman walks through. Everybody bows. But Mordecai, because he's security, he knows how to sniff out a rat. And so Mordecai, he's sized up Haman. He's like, I don't like this guy. 
And also, Mordecai is a believer in God. He doesn't bow to anyone except God. And so Mordecai is standing right there with his arms crossed while everybody else is bowing. And he looks pretty tall in a sea of rear ends. And Mordecai is just standing there <laughs> like, hey, what's up, man? What's up? And, and Haman's like, are you kidding me? This guy, this, this guy, he, he disrespects me. Everybody bows, but not him. And yeah, he could beat me up, but I don't like this guy. And so Haman decides... Haman decides he's going to go after Mordecai just because Mordecai won't bow. Here's the thing. Sometimes the culture will go after you because you don't bow. But here's the thing. Don't forget God's on your side in that situation. Don't forget. But this is what Haman did. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality. He was a racist too. So he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. Like I said, this guy's dark, and it only gets darker and darker because Haman's plan is horrible. He goes to the king, because again, he's second in command. He goes to the king, and he puts a sheet of paper on the king's desk, and he tells the king this. He said, there is a race of people. He doesn't even name them. But he said, there's a race of people in your kingdom who don't follow your laws. They don't listen to you. They don't respect you. All of that's a lie. All of that's a lie. He says, they don't listen to you. They don't respect you. They're a threat to you. They're going to try to take you out. And Xerxes, historians tell us he was very impulsive. And he didn't really think stuff through. Like one day, one time he was trying to build a bridge of boats to cross a certain strait in a, mil- in a military campaign. And when the ocean didn't cooperate with him and his bridge fell apart, he ordered his soldiers to whip the ocean to punish the ocean for going against him. He's just a weird dude. And Xerxes, uh, Xerxes is like, well, you know, I guess whatever you say, because he's not thinking. He's not thinking. So he signs the sheet of paper, not even realizing what he's doing. And Haman is now one because that sheet of paper says that all Jews would be exterminated on March 7th. Do you realize Haman was trying to order a a Holocaust uh, 2,400 years before World War II? He was trying to do a Holocaust 2,400 years before the Holocaust. That's how dark he was. But, But meanwhile, back at the palace, Esther is winning this beauty pageant and she is crushing it, all right? There is no competition. She's destroying the competition. And every, every competitor gets to have one date with the, with the king. And after one date, just one date, not only does he declare her queen and she wins, not only that, but he declares a banquet in her honor. He declares a national holiday in her honor. He is head, the king is head over heels in love with Esther, I mean, he would do anything for her. He is smitten with her like a little schoolboy. He loves her so much, and she wins. And it's gotta be, I mean, can you imagine just putting yourself in her shoes? I mean, just a few weeks ago, she was living in an apartment. Now she's living in a palace. Just a few weeks ago, no one really knew her name, and now she is queen over an entire empire. She's queen over 127 different provinces where they speak dozens of different languages. She's queen of territory from Africa to Europe to Asia. She's married to the most powerful man in the world, and I'm sure she's trying to figure out why. I mean, I can just see her in my imagination walking into this beautiful palace, beautiful banquet hall, and, she's, and everyone raises their glass. A toast to Queen Esther, a toast to Queen Esther. And in the back of her mind, she's very intuitive, she's very smart. In the back of her mind, she's thinking, why did God put me here? What is my purpose? Why did God put me here? Well, she didn't have to ask that question for long because that night she gets a knock on the door and it's one of her servants, and it's late at night. She gets a knock on the door, and her servant says, "Uh, Queen Esther, I am so sorry to bother you. We are so sorry to bother you, but we've got a situation. Your cousin Mordecai didn't come into work today, and he always comes into work on time. He's very punctual, but he didn't show up today, and so we investigated, and we did find him running down the street, weeping, crying, and he, his clothes were torn and he had ashes on his head, which in the, in the Jewish culture was an expression of grief, of sorrow. And, he, and, and, and Esther, of course, was concerned about him. So she sent a messenger to Mordecai saying, are you okay? Like, are you all right? And Mordecai sends a message back. And the message is a copy of the decree her husband signed calling for the extermination of all Jews on March 7th. And so now Esther understands why Mordecai was wearing torn clothes and why he put ashes on his head. Now she gets it. 
And Mordecai sends another message to Esther saying, you got to do something. You're the only person who can do something. You're a queen. Please, please do something. And this is, this is Esther's response. This is Esther's response. Then Esther told Hack, 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 Tic Tac, whatever his name is. <laughs> then Esther told Hack, that I give up, to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All, this is what Esther said. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter and the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. As, you know, there, there's this misconception that great leaders never feel fear. There's a misconception that I think we have today that great leaders never feel anxiety or never wonder if they're up to the job. Because I'm a nerd, I study history all the time because I'm just a nerdy dude. Um, my, I, I read about presidents all the time. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion, but in my opinion, the greatest president we ever had was Abraham Lincoln. I believe he was the greatest. And there's a lot of reasons. If you want me to bore you, I could list all the reasons why. But I think he was the greatest. You, would, you will never find a leader that had more crippling anxiety than Abe Lincoln. He was always scared that he wasn't big enough for the job. He would write letters saying, I just feel like this is too big for me. And he would get on his hands and knees at night praying to God, asking for help, because he didn't know, how do I lead? And yet, I would argue he was the greatest leader in American history. And Esther is a phenomenal leader. She doesn't know it yet. That's the thing. There's a lot of great leaders in this room where you're a great leader, you just don't know it yet. Esther is a great leader. She doesn't know it yet. She feels, she's telling Mordecai, this is too big for me. This is too big for me. And, and she get, she, her concern is true. In Persian law, if someone walked into the court unannounced, uh, they could be executed on the spot. The king, all he had to do was extend his scepter and that person, their head, gone. And she's telling Mordecai, what do I do? I, I don't know if I can do that. But then Mordecai encourages her. Here's the thing. I hope you have a Mordecai in your life. I hope you have somebody who encourages you in a moment of decision. I hope, you have, I hope you have a Mordecai, but even more than that, I hope that you are a Mordecai for somebody else. I hope that you give encouragement to someone in your life who needs it. Because this is what Mordecai said. He said this, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, look, this is your moment. You are a leader. You might not realize it, but you are a leader, Esther. This is your moment to speak out. Esther, this is your moment to speak out. And this is Esther's response. And I am going to base the entire rest of this message on her response. And I promise I'll do it quickly, but I'm gonna base the rest of the message on her response. This is how a leader talks. Go, this is what she said. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. It's the most famous line from the book of Esther. If I perish, I perish. That is what leadership looks like. She's, an, she's a phenomenal leader. She's one of the greatest examples of leadership in your Bible. And I just wanna talk about three these are very simple points. Just like last week, these are very simple points. I just want to talk about three reasons why Esther was a great leader. And here's the first one. The first reason is this. Esther spoke out on behalf of others, not just herself. You know what Esther could have told Mordecai? She could have said, you know what? I'm queen of Persia. I mean, I, you know, I know that there's an edict that all my people will die, but I'm safe. Like, I'm okay, I'm, I'm all right. Like, it, this doesn't really affect me. Like, I know that this is happening and I'm sorry, but I'm queen of Persia and it's, it, I mean, I'm safe, I'm safe. Nothing's gonna happen to me. And maybe you say, Stephen, that is kind of heartless. But you know what? That form of leadership is becoming more common today. You know, I, I see leaders, and I'm, I'm not gonna name names or anything, but there are leaders in our world today where they're supposed to be serving the people they lead, but instead, it's just kind of like, I'm just looking out for me. Right. And that's not what leadership actually looks like. That is not what leadership looks like. Do you, do you wanna know what leadership looks like? Do you wanna see what leadership looks like? I'll show you what it looks like, check this out. 
Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. That is what leadership looks like. That is what leadership looks like. (laughs) To be a leader is to be a servant. That's why Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, you become the least. You you serve other people. I mean... (laughs) I, I, I read news from all over the world all the time, and I continue to see this trend of leadership where there's just no empathy. There's just no uh, uh, basic human compassion among leaders who are responsible in certain cases for millions of people. There needs to be empathy. There needs to be compassion. There needs to be mercy. Because when you're a leader, serving the people is what being a leader means. You know, I, I see sometimes people say servant leadership is the best kind of leadership. I agree. I think that's a great statement, but I'm going to take that a step further. I'm going to take that a step further. Servant leadership is the only kind of leadership. It is the only kind of leadership. If you, it's, if you find a leader who wakes up every morning and they say, how can I make the people who work for me or the people that I'm responsible for, how can I make their lives better? Those are the best leaders, without a doubt, without a doubt. Those are the best leaders. You know, and, and I understand in this celebrity culture, what I'm saying is like a foreign language, all right? In this celebrity culture, I remember uh, there, there's, a, there's a funny story that pastors pass around to each other. Pastors like to share goofy stories with each other. And this, this is one of my favorites. You might have heard this before, but there was a celebrity who was uh, having to buy his own groceries one day because I guess the person who normally bought his groceries for him was off or on vacation or whatever. And so he's in the, the line at the grocery store checkout and uh, he feels like he's not getting good enough service because he's having to wait. 10 minutes go by, 20 minutes go by. And so he just loses it. And so he yells at the cashier, do you know who I am? And she doesn't recognize him. She doesn't even, I guess she never saw his TV show, I guess, I don't know. So she doesn't recognize him, so she just keeps checking people out. She ignores him. And he realizes he's not getting her attention. He's like, how could I not get her attention? I'm a celebrity, everybody knows me. And so he yells even louder, do you know who I am? And she, you know, she's used to crazy guys. She just keeps checking people out, just ignores them. And so he says, all right, this is it. She's, I cannot believe this. And so he storms right up to the front of the line and he gets right in the cashier's face and he yells, do you know who I am? And without flinching, without even flinching, she picks up the phone and she calls security. And she says, hey, you guys got to get down here. I think we got a situation. We got a guy here who's in a bad mental state. And, and security on the other end is like, well, well why, why is he in a bad mental state? And the cashier said, because this guy doesn't know who he is. <laughs> we live in a culture that is training, do you know who I am leaders? And it's like, and that's not, that is anti-leadership. Here's the thing, maybe you know someone who's a do you know who I am leader and it's tough to work in that environment. It's tough to be in that environment. It's tough to deal with that. But I don't know about you, but I have had the pleasure of coming across, coming across a different kind of leader. And maybe, maybe you know someone who's this kind of leader. Maybe you are someone who's this kind of leader, but I've come across a, a leader who's, whose attitude asks a different question. Their attitude doesn't ask the question, do you know who I am? Their attitude asks the question, do you know how much I care about you? And if you know a leader like that, you know a leader that people follow. You know, I, 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 you know, I see this with my dad. My dad is a do you know how much I care about you leader. And that's one of the reasons why it's a pleasure to be around him because he has a spirit of saying, do you know how much I care about you? Those leaders change the world. Those leaders change the world. And our culture is not training that kind of leader, but you can still be that kind of leader. You don't have to let the culture, you don't have to let celebrity culture teach you how to lead. You can let God teach you how to lead and say, I'm going to be a do you know how much I care about you leader. And people will follow you to the ends of the earth. They will follow you to the ends of the earth. That's what leadership looks like because you grab your towel and you grab your water pitcher and you wash the feet of the people that you're responsible for. How many homes would change today if, that, if, if, if we were, do you know how much I care about you leaders? 
How many homes would change? How many businesses? How many countries would change today? Oh boy. Here's the thing. Servant leadership is the only kind of leadership. And Esther understood that. She said, I feel for my people. I love my people. I will serve them. I'm going to move on. I'm running out of time. Here's the second, here's the second reason Esther is a leader. Esther spoke out not just to virtue signal, but to actually lead. This is a big one today. This is a big one today. Because it, 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 uh, the, 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 I'm going to try to preach this, and I don't know how. But in our culture today, virtue signaling has become an easy way to pretend like you care. And it's become prevalent. And it's, it's not a substitute for leadership. You know, leadership, leadership goes beyond that. Leadership is bigger than virtue signaling. You know, our first responders that took care of our city on Friday night, they understand what leadership is. They understand what that means. I mean, they were out there risking their lives for us. And I just, I, I admire their courage. They don't, they don't, they're not into virtue signaling. They're into leadership. I mean, can you imagine if you called 911 and they were virtue signaling? Can you imagine what that phone call would sound like? Like, you're like, hey, hey, the house, uh, I, I, my house is on fire. I need you guys to come out right now. And they're like, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Wow. Uh, like, uh, you know, like, I, I can't imagine what it must be like to be in your position. And you're like, lady, please just get down here. Please come down here. My house is on fire. And she's like, well, you know, we're a little bit busy here at the station. We got a game of darts going on. Um, but, you know, we feel for you. We stand in solidarity with you. We understand your struggle. In fact, I just changed my Facebook profile picture to a picture of a fire extinguisher to show how much I empathize with your struggle. I'm so sorry. That's not what they do. You call 911. What do they say? What's your name and address? We're coming down there to put the fire out because that's what leadership looks like. That's what it means to be a leader. And they took care of us on Friday night because they understand it. You know, I, I was, I was, you know, I was in my basement, like, you know, like a, a lot of us were, and I heard the sirens while, while the city was taking cover and the tornado was still on the ground. I heard the sirens as they were driving, not away from the danger, but towards the danger, because they're not just virtue signalers, they're leaders, they're leaders. And we live in a virtue signaling world, but here's the cool part. You can still be a leader in, the, in a virtue signaling world because that's, that's, how, that's, how Jesus, that's what Jesus taught us to do. Jesus died for us on a cross and that cost him something. But he saved us because he understood it. It's, it's not just about virtue signaling. Here's the thing, we need leaders. We need leaders today who believe that virtue signaling is not enough. I wish I knew how to preach this. We live in a world, we need leaders who, today who, who believe virtue signaling is not enough. It's just, you know, Esther could have said, Mordecai, I sympathize. I sympathize with you so much, Mordecai. I sympathize with my people. I'm so sorry. But no, she went beyond that. She said, Mordecai, I will go to the king. I will go to the king. I will go to him. Even if I risk my life, I will go to the king. Because she wasn't a virtue signaler. She was a leader and a great one, a great one. Here's the third thing, and I promise I'll be done. I know I'm in overtime. Thanks for being patient with me. Esther spoke out even when it could have cost her. As you know, in the Persian law, if she went into that court unannounced, the king could have had her executed on the spot. And she, you know, remember what she said, how she said, if I perish, I perish. Do you remember that? She was willing to sacrifice for her people. You know, the greatest leaders I've ever seen are leaders who, who sacrifice for the people they lead. And they, they're willing to stand up for them, even if it costs them. You know, we live in a culture where a lot of people say they want to change the world, but only if it doesn't cost them anything. <laughs> Have you noticed this? But, and here's the thing, if you lead, even if you lead just if it doesn't cost you anything, you might still make a lot of money, you might win a lot of awards, you might get your name engraved on a plaque that goes in an award case, but you'll know at the end of the day, there was more you could have done. But if you lead self-sacrificially, where you give something of yourself to the people you lead, you give something of yourself to God, it doesn't matter how much money you made, it doesn't matter what parking spot you got, it doesn't matter what desk you got, it doesn't matter what vacation home you got, it doesn't matter about the accolades or the awards, at the end of the day, you'll know you gave everything you had to give and that will be enough. That will be enough. Because that, that's what leadership means. To, to sacrifice. And Esther, was, Esther laid her life down. 
And, you know, and I, I just want to tell you really quickly, since I'm running out of time, I want to tell you how the story ends. So Esther is bold and she walks into the royal court to talk to the king. And again, he could have had her killed on the spot. And when she walks in, you know, the king is sitting there with all of his advisors. And when she walks in, the advisors, their jaws just drop. They're like, oh my goodness, she's breaking all the rules. That is so crazy. And the king is watching and he was thinking, oh my goodness, she's breaking all the rules. That is so hot. <laughs> and, and he is, I mean, he thinks this is awesome. And so she walks in and he's like, baby, thank you so much for visiting me today. Uh, you can have anything you want. Oh, and he, oh, this is in the Bible. He says, you can have half my kingdom. I'll give you half my kingdom right now. If I were her, I would have thought about that. <laughs> um, but instead, she just says, look, I, I, I just wanted to invite you to a banquet. I wanted to invite you and Haman to a banquet so I could just spend some time with you. And he's like, baby, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. Let's put it on the calendar. And so they have a banquet and Esther is meaning to tell the, Esther wants to tell the king what she wants to say, but she's a little scared. And so she doesn't say anything in that banquet, but then she appears in the royal court again and they have another banquet. And at this banquet, Esther has the courage to speak out. I mean, she tells the king, she said, somebody's after me, someone's after my people and he wants all of us exterminated. And the king was like, how could anybody do that? Who is, who is this guy? Who would mess with my queen? Who would mess with my queen? And she points to Haman and she's like, that guy? And the king is not happy, not happy at all. And he is so angry. The king flies into such a rage. He's like, I need, I need to get some air for a moment. He walks out onto the terrace and he starts thinking about what he's gonna do to Haman. And he has Haman blindfolded because he's like, dude, I don't want you to see what's gonna happen to you. All right, and so he has Haman whacked but on top of that, he's like, man, I just got rid of my second in command. Who, who should I replace him with? And he was like, oh yeah, that guy Mordecai, who's my bodyguard, that guy's awesome. He's a big guy, but he's got a teddy bear heart. I love that guy. He's awesome. And so he makes Mordecai second in command over the entire empire. And millions of people's lives are saved. And the king, the, the king is able to protect the Jewish people so that way what was coming to them doesn't happen. He protected them and the story ends beautifully. It all goes well. But you know what? It was because a brave young woman understood what leadership means. She understood what leadership means. Let's pray really quick. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the leaders here today. Father, thank, I thank you for the moms and dads. I thank you for everyone who was uh, protecting us Friday night. I thank you for their courage and their bravery in the face of such a difficult situation. Father, I pray for all the leaders here, and I pray that you would give us the strength to be leaders in this world. I pray that you would help us to serve the people we lead and to, and to wash their feet, uh, to wash their feet at home, to wash their feet at work, to wash their feet everywhere we go. Father, help us to be servant leaders. Help us to have that spirit. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed, I know we're in overtime, but I just wanna give an invitation. If you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, let's do that right now. Let's do that right now. I'm gonna pray a prayer, and these aren't magic words. These are just calling out to God saying, yes, I want you in my heart. And you can pray that out loud or you can pray it silently to yourself, but let's do that today. Let's not wait. Let's not wait another day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know I've done wrong things. I know that I've sinned, but I believe you love me anyway. I believe you sent your son to die on a cross for my sins. And I believe he arose from the grave. Please come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, I know we're in overtime, but all you have to do is go out to the info center out there or to the one over by the student area and just say that you prayed to accept Christ and they'll give you this amazing box. It's got a Bible in it. It's also got a book called My New Walk with God that answers a lot of questions and some other cool stuff. Thank you so much for being at New Spring. <laughs>